It is said that there are three topics that should be avoided in social situations at all costs. Religion, politics, and money. Well, today we are going to speak to all three. The way I find my guests for my show is by following my own curiosities while scrolling the internet. So essays, fashion blogs, news sites, Instagram for you pages, and, you know, sometimes the occasional celebrity gossip hub. But back in February, I first learned about Texas State Representative James Tallarico from a viral Twitter headline. There was a photo. He was standing next to his mother holding a proposed bill that he'd filed. And the tweet read, I was born to a single mom who worked long hours at a hotel. Just days after giving birth to me, the hotel forced her to go back to work. Today, she joined me as they filed legislation to enact paid family leave for all Texans. Within a few clicks of my browser, I learned that Representative Tallarico had been a public school teacher. He also at one point was the youngest legislative representative on the Texas Capitol floor. We reached out a couple months back, and I'm happy to say that I was finally able to interview him in between sessions last week. While business has been going as usual on his end, my understanding and involvement in local politics has completely changed in the last six weeks, which if you've been following me on social media or listening to my cold brew conversations that come out every Monday, you've heard me talk about my experiences protesting here in Nashville at the Capitol building for gun control, as well as protesting the expulsions of Representative Justin Jones and Representative Justin Pearson of the Tennessee Three. I went from not even thinking people were allowed into the Capitol building to being there three times in the matter of a single week and knowing my preferred parking garage and walking route. I want to continue my understanding and how local politics work and how we as a community can enact the changes we need by working with our local elected officials. This is all new to me. And if it's new to you too, do not worry. There are no dumb questions. Well, maybe there are some dumb questions, but you still don't have to worry because I will be the one asking them all to Texas House Member Representative James Tallarico of District 50. Um, Well, first of all, I love that you like just came from the floor. You're zooming in. I have learned so much in the last couple of weeks. I live here in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, and so we've we've had a whole um, I've been a part of a like a whole movement in this last couple of weeks, just just within the Nashville community. And I'm still really new to being a Nashvillian. But I want to and we'll get to that. But I want to give some context and how I came across your name. You live in Texas. You're a Texas representative. And I, when I'm looking for stories or people that I hope to sit down with, it's really just like going on news stories or websites that I visit. And I came across um, a story that was written about you based off of a tweet that you wrote. And it was you oh. with your mom. Yeah. And that yeah, you yeah. were, that you grew up with a single mom who worked yeah. at a hotel and that you were hoping to pass a bill for a paid family leave. And it was really important and special for you to be standing there with your mother in an effort yeah. to get this bill passed. And I just was so moved um, by your, just by your story and by that moment. And that was kind of the impetus of me wanting to sit down with you. And this was back in, I think like February or January yeah. of this year. Yeah. So I am very excited to sit down with you and I have a million questions. And so thank you for being here today. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. Um, I have been to Nashville once in my life, but as a big country music fan, um, I had a blast there. And it's very similar. I I live in Austin, Texas, which is the live music capital of the world. I don't know if y'all would dispute that, but uh, (laughs) it's very similar cities. So yeah, it's great to be here and and great to chat with you. Well, it's so similar. I think it's like the what the great uh, like so many people from LA moved to either the joke was Nashville or Austin. So I and I'm one of those jerks. I ended up yes, in Nashville, that's, but <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. It's a well, it's a beautiful city. Um, well, I'd love to just introduce the listeners to to who you are. I know. Speaking of Texas, you're an eighth generation Texan. So you've been there forever. Yeah, you know, my family was here when it was Mexico. Uh, before it was Texas. And uh, I'm a little biased, but I think it's the greatest state in the nation. Um, it's 
It's um, filled with every kind of person, every kind of landscape, um, every kind of piece of culture that you could imagine. Um, it's this hodgepodge of all these different people and places and experiences. And what defines the state is our hospitality. Our official motto as a state is friendship. We're the friendly state. And anybody who's been to Texas can can tell you that that kind of friendly attitude is, is what we're known for. Uh, and so even, even in that um, amazing diversity, we still uh, create bonds of friendship with one another. And that's what democracy is all about. So yeah, it's it's wonderful to to be a Texan, and it's wonderful to to serve in the Texas legislature. Did you always have your sights set on work? I mean, I know you worked as a school teacher, but was there ever a part of you from a young age that thought you would work in politics? <laughs> you know, I, I my mom going through that experience that that you kind of alluded to really radicalized her in in a lot of ways. You know, she became an activist for women's rights. She um, uh, volunteered for Planned Parenthood and an organization called TARAL, which doesn't exist anymore, but it stands for the Texas Abortion Rights Action League. And so I was taken to rallies and uh, lobby days when I was uh, um, when I was in elementary school and middle school and high school. So I, I always knew that public service and political activism were, were paramount. And it was an obligation that every citizen had to fulfill. And so that's why I was a college organizer uh, for issues like tuition relief. That's why I became a public school teacher, why I led a nonprofit, and why I ran for office. Um, so yeah, I think service and activism in some form has always um, been a part of my, my story and my upbringing. It's so interesting. I, I feel like I had the opposite. Like I, I, I knew that my parents were involved with uh, a their political party that sure. in that they resonate with. I knew that they would host mm -hmm. gatherings and fundraisers, but I never really saw knew understood what it meant. I never understood yeah. um, had any idea like what the idea of activism or going to protest. I never was really exposed to that um, until much later in life, yeah. and I, I never even really had a true understanding of the significance and importance of like local government. I had an yeah. understanding that when you're 18, you can vote for the president and that's pretty cool. Right. Uh, yeah. And then that was it. I, I yeah. just, I didn't, you know, I, that for me, so it's been really interesting to now like have such a deep desire to want to yeah. not only expose my children to um, that, that they can actually go and enact change that right. they want to enact in the world. Um, right. And also to open them up to the idea that of the responsibility that they can take upon themselves to educate themselves um, right. as they grow in life. But it's yeah. so powerful that you, from a young age, were introduced to activism. Was, yeah. was there something that stuck out? Was there like a moment or a protest or like a, a volunteer opportunity when you were young that that is really sticks out in your mind that that you yeah think. well and, and just I think what we're talking about is a different um, uh, understanding of citizenship and, and you mentioned that oftentimes we just tell people to vote just go vote register to vote and turn out to vote right and so we kind of and and for me and what I was taught voting is the bare minimum right voting voting is a floor not a ceiling and we are called as citizens, as Americans, to do a lot more than voting. Um, we've got to um, support candidates for office with our money, with our time, with our resources. We've run for office for ourselves. We have to lobby our legislators. We've got to call lawmakers and advocate for policies that we care about. So that's, that, is, that entails a lot more than just voting every four years or every two years. Um, so, yeah, that completely resonates with me. And, and like I said, that was what I was taught, not only from my mom, but I also say from my church, you know, my mom joined St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in North Austin, right outside of Austin city limits. And that church was, um, they had a very political understanding of the message of Jesus Christ. And their whole mission was taking our, our words that we say in the sanctuary and putting it into action on the streets. 
And so my first protest was not only with my mom, but also with my church congregation members. And it was in 1998. So I was in fourth grade and it was outside the governor's mansion here in Texas. The governor at the time was George W. Bush, who would go on to be president. And it was right after the killings of Matthew Shepard and and James Byrd. And so the, what we were protesting was, uh, was the governor's inaction on hate crimes legislation. We were calling for hate crimes legislation to be enacted in Texas. And it wasn't that big of a group. I mean, it must have been 15 people. And we were standing on the street corner right outside the governor's mansion with a bullhorn. You know, I was little, so it was it was a formidable experience for me. It was the first protest I ever went to. Um, but that led to when I was in middle school going to anti-war protests. That was the Iraq war. The Iraq invasion was uh, underway. Uh, and then even more advocacy in, in high school and college. So, um, you know, activism is just like anything else. The earlier you start, the more likely you're going to do it into adulthood. Um, and it's a skill and a value that we have to teach the next generation. So, yeah, that was probably the the that protest in in ninety eight is probably the one that stands out the most to me. I really didn't think you'd say you were going to say church was one of the <laughs> <laughs> like, a place of political activism <laughs> that yeah. sparked that for you. Didn't yeah. see that coming. And I yeah. did see a video. I think it was either on your social or just in researching you. And you were actually at a church specifically speaking on uh, abortion rights and also right. trans rights. And right. I just was very, I just was thought that that was very um, powerful to see yeah. uh, that you were in a church speaking on these political yeah. issues. And so then yeah. to hear that you were part of a congregation that specifically, um, yeah. that, that's you just you usually don't hear that in the same sentence. Um, well, and you don't for folks who are on the left. You do hear it a lot for people on the right. Mm -hmm. You know, the religious right has defined our politics, our culture, our society for 40 years, right? A lot of the, at least the issues that I'm fighting back against, the extreme abortion ban here in Texas, that doesn't even allow for exceptions in the case of rape or incest. Same um, in Tennessee. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, the, the bills that are moving that are going to deny parents of trans kids the ability to give their kids the health care they need, even when multiple doctors sign off on it, right? Um, a bill that we heard yesterday here in the Texas House that would force every public school district in the state to display the Ten Commandments in every classroom. I mean, this kind of stuff is the direct result of the influence of the religious right. So mixing politics and religion is something that the right is very used to doing. It's something the, the left used to do, um, the civil rights movement, the labor rights movement, the women's movement, the farm workers movement, all of these were grounded in, um, in religious institutions and religious communities, not always uh, Christian, I should say, right? Mahatma Gandhi's movement was a Hindu movement in, in India. So, but, but the point is that, um, Politics has to be rooted in something deeper than just partisanship or electoral success. Uh, it's got to be rooted in, in some kind of framework of, of meaning. And the right has understood that in recent years, and that's why they've been so successful with their reactionary policies. It's something the left, I think, has to remember how to do. What is the split in the House uh, in Texas? Uh, and like you're a Democratic representative, yep. you're a Democrat. What is the split? So we have 64 members, I believe, that um, uh, that are belong to the Democratic caucus in the state in the state house. There are 150 members total. So um, shy of a majority, you need 76 to be uh, in the majority, um, but not as far away as I think some people would think. I, there's a, there's a misconception that. Texas is this overwhelmingly red state. And that's just not true. Donald Trump won Texas in 2020 by only five points. So Texas is a lot closer than people realize. Um, and it's rapidly moving in our direction. Uh, I think Mitt Romney beat Barack Obama in this state in 2012 by more than 12 points. So the fact that we've taken a 12-point margin and we've, mm -hmm. we've uh, reduce that to a five-point margin. 
Texas is now bluer than Ohio. It's bluer than Florida. They, those states are talked about as swing states, and we're not, even though the numbers would suggest that we are much more of a swing state than Ohio and Florida. So um, anyway, I, I, I want folks to realize that we are in the minority here, but we're a lot closer than people think. Well, it's so interesting. So I... A couple weeks ago here in in, Nash, in Nashville, um, there was a school shooting, the Covenant shooting. Six lives were lost. Three of these were children. Um, there was a protest uh, later that week, and I participated in that protest, went to the Capitol building with a bunch of moms. It was very yeah. powerful. It was emotional. I've spoken on this podcast already about how what was so incredibly moving for me was to see how many kids turned out to yeah. this, pro- how many teens were out there. And right. we actually were invited into the Capitol building in the atrium area, um, not on the floor, but into kind of, and obviously sure. you could go in and sit and watch um, in like the upper pews. I, I know that there's a name for it, but <laughs> in the gallery? Yeah, gallery? gallery? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yep. in the gallery. I'm learning. Yep. Um, but yeah, it was the first time I'd ever nice. been to a Capitol building. And I was I like, oh, we're just allowed. Like we waited yeah. in line. We went yep. through um, through metal detectors and security. Sure. We waved to the guards. We got to go and to the atrium and, and protest. And it was so yep. empowering. Yeah. And unfortunately... Um, there were many representatives who were wouldn't even stop and look at these kids in the eye. Mm-hmm. There, there were representatives that then went on the news to say that it, to compare the protests that we many Nashvilleans participated in as a like as reminiscent of uh, January sixth, an wow. insurrection, which could not have been farther from the truth. Yeah. As someone who was there, um, yeah. with with people that I know on both political lines, to be honest, yeah. with a yeah. group of moms on that go on both political lines. Yeah. And, uh, and I just, I, it, it just like lit a fire in me. I, there was another, uh, uh, you know, protest at the Capitol that following Monday I brought my kids and we yeah. got to go in and I got, you know, it was, I got to show my daughters like what it means to be able to go into the Capitol and have another understanding of this is the people's house. Right. And then by that following Thursday, um, I was there and was sitting in the gallery when the expulsion was called for yeah. uh, the Tennessee Three. And I, it was like within one week, I learned more about how, the, yeah. how like localized government works than I ever did in school, <laughs> than I ever did in my yeah. entire life. Yeah. And it just kind of cracked my brain open and made me want to like have so many other people realize like, oh my gosh, look what, this is what's going on in that building. Yeah. I had no idea. Right. So you were a teacher. Um, yeah. I would like to ask just like a handful of ridiculous questions yeah. and be a student for a moment, there if that's are, okay. There are no ridiculous questions. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> um, for the state capital, what is decided at the state capital generally? Yeah. Like what should people uh, know about the importance of like what gets decided at the state capital? Almost everything. I, I don't <laughs> think people quite understand how important state government is. Um, local governments are super important, you know, especially if you're thinking about local issues like um, zoning or potholes, um, you know, infrastructure, super important. The federal government is obviously very important. If we're talking about foreign policy, going to war, um, if we're talking about um, immigration policy, those are decided at the federal level. But really everything that's not one of the things I mentioned is decided by the states. Um, So healthcare, education, criminal justice, environmental policy, all of these things are decided at the state level. So, you know, that's personally why I decided to run for the state legislature and rather than run for a local school board is because I know that this is where the action happens. And that's not just true in Texas, that is true everywhere. And, And I'm so glad that you... Uh, and and it sounds like your community members are taking ownership of the democratic process because that building, whether it's the state capitol here in Austin or it's the state capitol in Tennessee, it belongs to you, right? It belongs to us. There's this perception that we don't belong there. We're not welcome there. But literally the people in those buildings are working for you. You are their boss. And so it's uh, it's so inspiring to see what's happening in Tennessee, what's happening here in Texas, what's happening in in state capitals around the country, because people have to wake up um, and understand how important state government is and understand that state government is directly accountable to you. So 
before the before it was taken to the floor to decide on the expulsion of Representative Pearson, Jones, and uh, Johnson, um, we I, I was up there in the gallery for like two hours. Once I got a seat in there, I was like not moving. I and this is like. For for everyone listening that knows how much I talk about Bravo, this was better than Scandal. I mean, you once you get in there and you yep. just see like the politics within the politics, it is yep. like you are on the edge of your seat. And I can't believe yep. that this is what you guys do yep. ev- like every day. Um, and before it even got to um, the discussion of an expulsion, there were 29 bills on the floor that everyone needed to get through. And yep. these are really important things. This, th- there was a moment of, whether uh, jobs would require you to have to uh, prove that you'd had a, a COVID shot. Um, and then it got it brought up the fact that, you know, there was a Republican representative that said that you shouldn't have to, like you shouldn't have to prove that you've, you know, had a, a COVID vaccine. With, then another Democratic representative said, well, I think we're taking in, so you mean like your body, your choice. Is that what you're bringing into it? Right. And then all of a sudden we're talking about, uh, you know, trans rights at a school in sports. And, they, and they're all within the neighborhoods that we live in here. And I think that people don't understand how many of these bills are being brought to the floor, how much they affect their lives. How many bills do go through are brought to the floor in, in a se- in what is a session? Is a session just a yeah. whole year? Is it like a school year? Yep. So it depends on the state. So here in Texas, uh, we don't have a full-time legislature. We're a part-time legislature, which means we meet in session for f- about five months every other year, um, which when you think about it, is kind of a crazy way to run a state, especially a state as big as Texas. We have 30 million people that we're creating public policy for. And the fact that we try to solve all the big problems that our big state faces in five months every other year uh, it creates, it makes for a chaotic process to say the least. Um, but I just want to, I think you're, and, and the amount of bills that passed through, by the way, it's, I think 8,000 bills were filed in the last legislative session here in Texas. Obviously, most of those don't become law because the process is set up to slow down legislation. But yeah, the sheer number of ideas that are being discussed and debated in a compressed timeline is, is staggering. And you're right. It's, it's, not only important, not only are these decisions many times life or death issues, but it's also very entertaining. So for anyone who thinks politics is boring or politics is is unengaging, spend some time at your legislature. Um, Molly Ivins was a great Texas journalist who once said that the Texas legislature is the finest form of free entertainment ever invented. <laughs> and I'm sure that's true in, in other states. Capitals. And so I would recommend folks just tune into the live stream in whatever state you're in uh, and watch it for a few hours and to see the the different personalities and the different tactics that are used to win a bill or to kill a bill. It, it will keep you on the on the edge of your seat um, the entire way through last uh, last session, 2021 here in Texas. Some of your listeners may remember that um, my fellow Democrats and I broke quorum uh, to stop the voter suppression bill. We literally walked off the floor of the House to deny them quorum. And we flew to Washington, D.C. and stayed there for more than a month trying to convince federal lawmakers to take action to stop the voter suppression bill in Texas. And so that was a wild, a wild adventure, too. Um, So, you know, we've kind of experienced some of the same um, the same extreme uh, uh, bills and trying to use, you know, tactics like quorum breaks, like protests, to slow down those pieces of legislation, just like y'all are experiencing in Tennessee. Are there people often in the gallery? How often do you see people who come through? Almost every day I see people in the gallery, some days more than others. But yesterday, you know, we were going to debate a bill that would deny trans children life-saving health care. And ultimately, we didn't get to the bill because Democrats called a point of order and we're, we're able to delay the bill a few days. But we had trans activists, uh, trans children, tra- parents of trans children in the gallery, and they also launched their own peaceful protest um, and were removed from from the gallery. Um, and in fact, there's video of 
of one of the law enforcement officers violently throwing down one of those trans activists outside the House chamber. Uh, we should say peaceful protest is the most American thing imaginable, um, whether it's the civil rights movement, whether it's the American Revolution itself, the Boston Tea Party was an example of nonviolent protest. So we as Americans have a rich history of nonviolent protest, um, and and we should all uh, participate in that whenever we get the chance and whenever uh, we are called to do so to defend our moral values. And that, as you have said, Candace, is different than what happened on January 6th, which was a violent protest, a violent insurrection that got people killed. And so these two things could not be more different uh, politically, morally, legally. Um, and anyone who tries to confuse a violent insurrection with a nonviolent, peaceful protest needs to, to take another look at American history. I've spoken with a lot of a lot of members of the community who, like myself, are kind of new to participating in social activism or protesting or just really, you know, for lack of a better word, tuning in and actually paying attention and participating and wanting to um, see change and can find it very overwhelming, can find it discouraging. Uh, we live in a society of getting, I mean, if I wanted a br breakfast burrito right now, I could click a few buttons. It'll be here in 20 minutes. We're used to things happening very quickly. Um, what do you say to members of your community or even to yourself when you hit a point of feeling of feeling down or frustrated or or um, or just hopeless if that ever yeah. happens, or if you because you've had like such a, um, a an experience in life where you've you know the it's a long game. Do you sure. do you hit points of hopelessness? Yes, I flirt with hopelessness all the time as a progressive in the Texas legislature. Um, but I mentioned earlier about my activism journey being rooted in in the church and. And the fact that many of the most successful social movements in our history have been rooted in, in communities of faith. I think that's why, is because these movements are a relay race, right? Um, you have to trust that your sunset is going to be someone else's dawn, right? That you are, you are handing off the baton to the next generation to continue this struggle because it's never done, right? Um, we, we win victories and then we've got to move on to the next the next problem and try to make things more just and more, more equal. Um, so having that, that long view, having that faith, I think is the only way to sustain this work. Otherwise you get burnout. Otherwise you do succumb to hopelessness. Um, and it's very difficult to, to get out of that quicksand once you're in it. How is it, uh, working with you know the various colleagues and you're you're the youngest legislative legislative member correct uh i was elected as the youngest member we thankfully got some, some more <laughs> younger members elected this last cycle so uh, nice I'm, I'm 33 but we've got a few 30 30 year olds and 31 year olds now which wow is good. we need um, even younger 33 is not that young so we got to get some 20 somethings back in yeah which is amazing. I mean, I can't even, I mean, I look back at my, <laughs> the things I was focused on when I was in my twenties and let me tell you, it was not, <laughs> well, not very sure. impressive. Um, sure. but, and so I am like, I am just so in awe of this younger generation and how involved they are. And, and sadly it's because they have to be, I mean, they're truly yeah. fighting for their lives. Even, yes. you know, the amount of conversations I've had with my seven-year-olds and my teenage yeah. stepkids over the years about, their active shooter drills and just realizing, you know, even kids who are in their late teens and 20s who have always been doing, have spent their entire academic career doing active shooter drills. And I was not part of that generation. Right. Um, I, I don't think you were either. I'm mm -hmm. only a couple of years older than you. Yeah. Um, but how how is it having this young generation and then maybe an old school generation all coming together yeah. to... Um, really dive into politics what is that yes. like on it i mean i have an assumption of what's that what that's like yes. is there any hope within that generationally um because yeah. it doesn't look great from the outside yeah. <laughs> yeah you know i was i ran for office the first time uh, my first campaign when i was 28 years old and uh and i turned 30 on the house floor um debating 
um, a piece of legislation. And when I turned 30, there were no other 20-somethings in the Texas legislature, which is really an astounding fact when you consider the demographics of Texas. Texas is one of the youngest states in the country. And the fact that everyone under the age of 30 no longer had rep- representation in that important deliberative body says something about our democracy. And so one, I, I think it's important to realize there are structural barriers to young people running for office. It usually takes a lot of money, right? It usually takes a network of wealthy people. Most of the time, young people don't have that. I certainly didn't have that. You can kind of circumvent that with social media, which is what I did to raise money from small dollar donors. But that's a structural barrier to young people running for office. Also, I said the legislature here is part-time. It's technically part-time, but really it's full-time because even when we're not in session, I'm going to events, I'm meeting with constituents, I'm working on policy, I'm handling constituent problems. And so it's a full-time job for all intents and purposes, but I only get paid $7,200 a year to do this job. That's $400 a month after taxes for anyone who's doing the math. That's obviously not enough to live on. So I've got to have another job outside of this one that actually pays my bills. Who really has the ability to do that, right? A public school teacher can't do that. Someone supporting a family can't do that. A nurse can't do that. That means the people who end up running for office are wealthy lawyers, wealthy doctors, wealthy business owners, wealthy ranchers, right? And and I'm not saying wealthy older people don't deserve a seat at the table, but they don't deserve every seat at the table. And so we've got to remove some of these structural barriers if we're going to encourage more young people to run for office. It's one thing to say young people should run, which is true, and we should say that, but we should also be committed to, to removing these barriers as much as we can to, to allow young people and, you know, and working class people and women and people of color and LGBTQ people, you know, people from non-traditional, um, non-wealthy backgrounds to run for office. What was the inciting incident for you to run for office? You were a middle school teacher. When did you decide to really take that leap? So I I started my first year of teaching in 2011 when the legislature here in Texas cut $5 billion from our public education budget. So I was literally on the front lines in a poor neighborhood in an under-resourced school dealing with the ramifications of those budget cuts. I saw kids have their services eliminated. Um, I had what a class services? Of, so, you know, mental health services primarily. I had one student who, um, who struggled with mental health issues. He was abused as a child um, and, and lived with his grandmother and had struggled in school all throughout elementary school. He brought a knife to school in fifth grade and threatened to kill his teacher. And so I got this kid in sixth grade, right? But thankfully, the school had had provided a, a therapist, and this kid had a great relationship with that therapist, and he was making big improvements, and he was working with me. He was doing great in my class. And then I find out that because of these budget cuts, they could no longer pay for the therapist. That kid suddenly nosedived, right? Um, this, this little bit of hope that he had been provided had been taken away from him, and he uh, started a fight with another kid. And that was his last straw. He was removed from school. And I honestly didn't, don't know where, where he went. I haven't heard from him since. I hope that he's doing okay, but it keeps me up at night thinking about what happened to him. So that, that experience is what, what led me to go into policy because I realized that as much as I was doing good in room 112 at Rhodes Middle School, my students were still trapped in these failed systems and, and being hurt by these, these terrible policies. And so that's why I decided to, uh, to kind of move out of the classroom space and, and try to get into the systems level policymaking decisions. For anyone that does want to explore running for office or is really inspired by your experience and your story, I mean, I know you can't, there's not like a one single singular yeah. roadmap to, to get there, but what what would you say are the top three things that are important to know if you're going to decide to run for office or to, in effort of running for office? Yeah. Well, one, I would tell anybody listening, they can always reach out to me and, and they can find me on any of the social media platforms. You can message me. If it's something you're really thinking about, I would love to, to talk to you and, 
and hear about your personal situation and, and how I may be able to help. But if I'm giving just broad advice, one is, is utilize the power of social media. That is something that young people have in our toolbox that the older folks don't. We have been collecting our entire network on these platforms since many of us were in high school or middle school. Use that. I, in my first week of my first campaign, I sat on, on my laptop and DM'd as many of my friends from middle school to high school, to college, to grad school, to the classroom. I DM'd all those folks, telling them I was running, telling them why I was running and asked for a donation of $25, $50, maybe $100 if they were a lawyer or I knew they had rich parents, right? Um, and I was able to raise $25,000 off of those DMs. And so that's just a, that sh- goes to show that you can raise some pretty serious money, at least seed money. Now you're going to have to grow beyond that, right? Um, so that would lead me to my second piece of advice, which is find good people to help you, whether it's professional paid staff or whether it's just someone that you trust, but you've got to have a team around you that's going to make you, um, it's going to make your operation professional because young people have got to be professional if they're going to be taken seriously. And so that means, you know, how are you reaching out to bigger donors to grow that campaign war chest after you've started out with your seed money? Um, how are you going to the right events? How are you having the right conversations with the, the leaders in your community? So having a good staff, having a good team is, is really critical. And then the last piece of advice is probably the most important, which is know why you're doing this. Um, it gets really hard. We've already talked a little bit about how hard it can get. Um, you have to be really clear about your why. You've got to know what your North Star is, because without a North Star, it is very easy to get lost in, in, in politics or in any industry. So doing that self-work on the front end, I think is a step that a lot of people skip over. Um, figure out why you're doing this, figure out who you're doing it for, what are those red lines that you're never gonna cross? Because you're gonna have to make compromises. God knows that I've made compromises, but as long as you know what that red line is, you'll be able to keep yourself on the straight and narrow. Do you feel like you still have your same why the, all these years later or has it changed? The why is the same for me. It's those kids that I served on the west side of San Antonio. They are still the first thing I think about when I walk into the Capitol. They are oftentimes the last thing I think about when I leave. I truly could just talk to you all day long because I do have a million questions, (laughs) but I know that you have much more important things to do today. But lastly, um, (laughs) talking to you is much more pleasant than what I'm going to deal with on the house. (laughs) Um, As far as when speaking of social media, so often people are say like, call your representatives, email your representatives. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to hear for everyone listening right now, what does it look on your side? How is that received? Because so often, especially when something is is like a very large movement yeah. or just like a very publicized movement. It's hard to ever talk to anyone. It just goes straight yeah. to voicemail. So you sure. always wonder like what happens on the other side of this? Yeah, great question. So it depends. If you're a constituent, that oftentimes puts you on a separate track. That's why it's so important to be calling your representative, your senator. The, the word your is doing a lot of work in that, in that instruction. Um, because if you're a constituent of mine, now your email, your phone call, your voicemail is going to be logged in our system. And then when I'm considering how to vote on an issue, my team is giving me a synopsis of all the constituent feedback we've received. And sometimes this is a representative democracy, meaning I'm elected to use my best judgment. Sometimes that means I disagree with my constituents and they can judge me in the next election on whether or not they think I should represent them again. But I do take it into account. Constituent feedback is a big a factor, a big variable in my decision making. It's not the only factor, but it is important. So can, being a constituent and, and voicing your opinion to your representative makes all the difference. Now, there is room for people who are not constituents, but usually in that scenario, you've got to get a, a large number of people to make contact to an office. Because sometimes we do, my team will tell me, like, we've been flooded with calls all day long on this issue. You know, our inbox is overflowing with folks against this bill. So if you can, if you can really get a big number of people together to, to make your voice heard on an issue, maybe you can have an impact even though you're not a constituent. But without that, you've really got to focus on your rep and your senator. And that's why, last thing I'll say is, it's important to partner 
with an organization or with a network of people because you and your state rep, that's only going to make so much of a difference. You've got to be part of a larger group. Uh, Politics is a team sport through and through, and it's not something you can do alone. So think about the issue you care about and then find the group or organization that's doing that work. And if not, be the one to start that group um, because we are so much stronger together um, in, in a democracy. Okay, I'll leave you with this. I, I love to ask my guests five questions before they leave. Yeah, it's just like a yeah. fun little word association or yeah. sentence association. Okay. Um, I'm so grateful for your time today. I know, oh. I hope that like, I hope the rest of your afternoon on the floor goes well. Thank um, you. Thank you for what you do. Uh, this has re-energized me, this conversation. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Yay. I'm so excited to hear that. Okay, so five last things before I let you go. One, just something that you like. Oh, goodness. Uh, I, <laughs> Willie Nelson just turned 90 years old. He's the patron saint of Austin. His album, Redheaded Stranger, is something I love. Perfect. Um, something that you know. Something that I know um, that people power will always win in the end. Something that you hate. I hate people who are not willing to change their mind. Something that you love that's not family or friends. Um, I love, I'm just saying this because it's on my mind, the trans children who showed up yesterday at the state capitol to advocate for their humanity. They shouldn't have to, but it was an inspiration to watch. And a quirky little fact about you. (laughs) Um, Well, I just... (laughs) I passed uh, a bill last week to fund fine arts education in Texas, and I shared a fun fact, which is that in high school, I played Danny Zuko in our production of Grease. Yes. When is the <laughs> last time you saw Grease, the movie? Be honest. Oh, it's been a while. I really? do love it. It's very different from the musical, by the way. Some of the best songs in the movie are not in the musical, unfortunately. This is, this is true. This is yeah. true. People do need you... to know. People need to know. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. And and also just, you know, your work as a teacher back in the day. And then now here's how you're still not only serving the community, but the children of Texas. And, and really just I'm, I, too, am just so freaking impressed by this whole generation of kids right now and how they re- they're not even going going to change the world. They are changing the world right now. And it's so beautiful. And so all I want is just like us as the grownups to just support them. Like they're, yes. they're just beautiful and amazing. And so I'm just, thank you for being one of those grownups as well. Of course. Thank you so much. This has been a Super Boom podcast hosted by me, Candace King, produced by Melissa D. Montz and Diamond Imprint Productions and advertisement partnerships with ACAST. <laughs>